I'm told that it is a casual connect tradition to start most sessions at 10 a.m. And so coming out at 9.30 is considered, given the number of parties they throw here, to be a great sacrifice. So I thank you all for making that. I was also promised that a large part of the audience would be hung over, but there will not be a sobriety test administered on, to get in. I have been in the games field uh, long, for about uh, almost as long as Arnold Hendrick, who's in the audience, which means over 30 years, and long enough ago to have given an Emerging Trends talk on online games at GDC in 1990. I will hope to be at least about half as accurate as I was then for this session. So I'm going to cover six emerging trends that you generally do not that you generally do not hear at other uh, at almost every other conference. So you won't be told that mobile is big. You won't be told that free to play is the next thing coming over here. I'm going to cover what's going on with devices, the changing face of publishing, uh, why why direct marketing is part of your future, whether you like it or not, modernization, the ubiquity of games, and, and the last thing I'm going to ask a question about whether or not traditional good games are going to, um, the definition of traditional ga good games are going to change. So first, for about, uh, for about 25 years, is there an issue with one? Sure. For about 25 years, oh sorry, for about 25 years, there, we have had an emotional relationship with the device with which we play. People say, I'm a PC gamer, I'm a console gamer. Uh, this is about to change. We are having a generation that will grow up that will basically have the device either be invisible or a secondary consideration. First off, the media, the game itself, is going to reside mainly in the internet cloud, and so will the game states, the delivery of new contact and the configuration and the configuration of how the game is put together will be stored and delivered remotely. So the device will disappear from the player perspective. That does not mean that you as developers can ignore it because you have to develop, you have to understand the ins and outs of the machine. But the, in the typical play pattern, the device will either be, you know, will either not exist, it will not, not be visible to the player, literally. They will only be worrying about the input device, that is how they, how they transact with the game, whether it's gestures, whether it's hand controls, whether it's spoken, and then they will be, uh, it will depend on which screen they project to. This will create, and the other thing that will matter is their relationship to the screen. In other words, are they playing in a typical television configuration, let's say eight to 14 feet away from the screen, or are they playing, uh, are they playing to something, a small handheld, that, a mobile device that is literally in their hands? The only way in which the device will matter to these people is when it's used as a remote. I think many of you are aware that the iPhone and the, um, and the Android phones are becoming very good remotes for the TV. So our, uh, in even larger measure, the tablet is going to become the major input device to the so-called the TV experience in the home. And it will also become the way that the way that people interface with games. So, in other words, you may be using the tablet itself to be able to do the commands while you were looking at a, a third screen. One of the things that we hear at almost every single conference is the major publishers say, "We're going to deliver games. That our games will be ubiquitous across every platform, every screen, every device." Um, and you, we will be able to deliver the same game uh, to, every to every device. That is, for the most part, a fiction. Um, no matter what we do, the um, uh, no matter what we do, the experience that a gamer has when they are playing with a three-inch wide screen on their on their a touch screen on their mobile versus something which has a joystick where they're looking at a television will require changes. You can get away with delivering the same game, but you will then be in a situation in which it is optimized for one of those configurations. The most successful games will have to be redesigned by hand. So while we will get, while we may get intermediated in terms of, um, you know, in terms of the devices we deal with, we will still have, there is still a crucial role for user experience designers, for interface designers, and for actually changing the gameplay depending on what the use state is. 
at one of the more interesting um, challenges that game designers will have, or I should say game developers and producers and the UI people will have, is what do you do when the player literally changes game state because they're playing in a, in a uh, static location, whether it be a Starbucks or their home, and then they say, gotta go, but I wanna continue playing it on my phone. So all of a sudden, they, as far as they're concerned, they're playing the same game, but they're moving on. This is one of the, if you want to remain as, you may be able to get away with not worrying about this problem in 2012, but I promise you that you will be having to worry about, worry about this issue by 2015 or 2017 at the latest. The next thing is the, um, the change in what is meant as a publisher. Um, one of the buzzwords that's going out is games as a service, which I abbreviate GAAS because I've seen that on us things out there. What has happened is we have made a migration from the traditional publisher, that is the company that puts the shiny disc in the cardboard box and sends it out to retail, retail outlets everywhere or delivers it to Amazon, which then ships it to your home. Many of, many of you who worked with publishers have seen them do uh, make adjustments for some of these competencies, but I'm going to offer a definition of what a publisher needs to be in, uh, in the digital market. Um, and then I would uh, very much like to hear uh, feedback for people who see things differently. The first job is programming, and that's programming in the television sense. So it includes title selection, you know, are you going to do first person shooters, are you going to do sims, uh, what the publishing slate is, are we going to be someone who concentrates on physics puzzles, are we going to have a diversity of titles, which demographic groups are we dealing with. And then the, the thing that we have generally not, uh, that we have generally seen as a secondary skill in traditional games, which is life cycle management. Usually life cycle management is we have the big launch event, we sell a bunch of games in the first three months, then we slowly fade it down. Then we do the patch because there was some horrible bug that went out with the, without, with the thing. And then eventually we figure out when do we put out the sequel or when do we put out the expansion pack. Now we have to figure out, you know, we have to figure out things down to not just when do we refresh a game, when we, do we deliver new contents, when do we do deliver new levels, but when do we, how do we schedule events? For example, does this, you know, are we going to make a big push for this game around the, the Christmas and Hanukkah holidays? Are we going to be, are we going to be introducing, you know, are we going to be introducing prizes into the game? It becomes an entire event scheduling and marketing exercise. And also means that you may decide that you want to, um, you want to, if a title is doing particularly well, you want, to, you want to basically put more resources into it. It is much more involved than we ever were before. The uh, companies that I would look to if this is an area you're not that familiar with are the Korean companies who have been doing this. The Chinese companies have been doing this too, but the Korean companies have been doing it uh, about two years longer. And it doesn't really matter which one you look at, whether it's Nexon or Gameville. The only issue is I would recommend that you try and go and get some of the presentations uh, that refer to the Korean market. Many of these, of course, are in Korean language, so that may not be helpful to most of you, but enough of them are translated into, into uh, Kringlish, that is Korean English, and can be found on, sl on SlideShare. Um, but these guys have gotten extraordinarily sophisticated in describing all the different moving parts that they do. The next is deployment. Uh, again, going back to the previous, uh, to the previous trend, um, you have to make a decision, okay, what, you know, what screens and what devices am I optimizing this for? What am I, not, what am I not giving a damn for? And the other thing, of course, is across territories. That may mean that, that uh, you decide that you're going to put out the game in North America and Western Europe, and you're going to choose, and you're going to choose partners for the um, the Asian markets. It may mean it, it may mean that you actually have a subsidiary out there, depending on what your your size is. It may mean that you do a joint venture where you do you know you do the design over here, and then you work with you work with a localization group over there, which also has distribution into the market. The next is direct marketing, which I will discuss in a, which I will discuss in the next slide. Um, Direct marketing is, consists of four components, which we'll review. And the last core competency is monetization. Monetization affects everything, 
in the digital world, and particularly in the free-to-play model, if you are not thinking about modernization from the very inception of the game design, then you are putting yourself at a tremendous competitive dis disadvantage. This is not something you can change your mind later. Um, we are seeing, for example, one of a, a wonderfully uh, delivered product, uh, Star Wars The Old Republic, which was developed over five and a half years, and it was delivered as a subscription game. I think it is a fine piece of work, but the problem is that the world is going away from the subscription model, and therefore it is not going to hit the numbers that they're going to hit. And even though the people who led the team, who are not now gone, uh, were both extremely familiar with free to play, it will be difficult to see it, the game migrate from, from the revenue model for which it was originally designed to free to play, which is expected to occur in the next three to six months. If you want to see an excellent example of how to take a traditional game and do it to free to play, uh, look at what Turbine did with Dungeons & Dragons Online. Which were, and, uh, uh, and Lord of the Rings Online. DDO, even though that was the first one, is uh, probably the most important case study, and Craig Alexander and his team have talked about what they've done, so you can probably, get, you can probably search on the net and find a test. But I'll leave you with one thought on how well they did the modernization. When Dungeons & Dragons Online was a failure, it uh, only got 50,000 subscriptions, which, and, was, and took a couple tens of millions to produce. After they made the free-to-play part work, and the free-to-play became the largest revenues, the number of subscriptions doubled to 100,000. So in other words, the number of people who were willing to pay up front increased while the free-to-play component, uh, free component delivered even more revenues than that. It, it's a rare example of somebody who was able to successfully change things over, and I commend it to you if you haven't gone through this process yourself. And I list the fifth thing because a number of publishers are doing this, so I do not consider it an absolute necessity, which is aggregation, which is taking on other people's titles. This is very similar to what, let's say, EA Partners does or any of the distribution deals. If you are in the aggregation business, understand that you are also in the business of uh, dealing with your outside developers and trying to fix some of the things they may not have thought out. They may not have thought through their revenue model. They may not have put things together. It is not as simple as, uh, as classic distribution, where you simply got the title, put it in the box, and then put it into your marketing pipeline, and actually you treat it as a second tier title, because of course your titles were going to get first treatment. But you have to, you have to do a, a light version of the first four things to be able to be, able to be in the, the successful aggregation business. Or you can have such a large audience, as, you know, uh, such a large audience that people want to deal with you anyway. We're all direct marketers now. Um, I strongly recommend that you get an education in direct in classical direct marketing. Um, there are a number of very good texts on it. The one that I rec the one that I recommend is Drayton Bird's uh, Bird, as in the thing with wings that flies, direct marketing. Um, he comes out of the classic direct response, the old Columbia House and the old mail order thing. The fifth edition does cover internet marketing, but what's, what's interesting is he anticipated a lot of the things that we are dealing with in a digital market in his first, second, and third editions, which inform the first 15 chapters. He's not the only one uh, that, that I would recommend. There's also database marketing, but it's the one that gives you a grounding. It's basically four parts. It's acquisition, getting, which is getting, you know, actually getting uh, people to try your game. It's retention getting them to come back and play it. Upsell, getting them to be able to buy something new or either to buy, you know, to buy into new levels or new items or to buy into new games. And it's customer service. The games field concentrates on, on two things, acquisition, and for those of us who have been in the online game field, it also spends time on customer service. But it's a broader definition. We are now seeing a incredible concentration on acquisition as so, to, to the extent that, as uh, one, of, one of the most successful companies in the field said, we are spending $1.25 to get a dollar's, dollar, a dollar's worth of business, which obviously is not a sustainable model. The reason is we are not, we are, everyone is in the business of acquiring, and nobody is, and very few people are spending time on retention and upsell. Again, I couldn't name, the Korean and Chinese companies are good at that. 
Um, there are there there are some players who are particularly good at that, but I'm not going to. Um, uh, I'd have to go to different names for each. Um, the good news for those of you who are in the field is that the games industry's direct marketing chops are pretty poor. So if you do things a little bit better than we're doing now, you will be able to see a fairly sizable uptick in terms of your performance. I mean, obviously, it's easy for me to say that if you're having problems acquiring customers in the first place, but I'm going to assume that you've been a successful game somewhere along the line or a game that's worth supporting. The bad news is that direct marketing is a highly prized skill and other industries, which are some of which are moving into games, are um, do have very good people. And they're starting to suck out the best people, uh, the best people from some of the game businesses. I've seen um, some of the top executives go to real estate listing companies, to uh, consumer goods companies, and they've been pulled out of the games field because they're, while they can make real money in games, they can make even greater money in those other places which have a better appreciation for what they do. This is one of the real challenges. You are trying to convince players to, you're trying to sell players on giving you first their time and attention and then their money. And there is nothing more effective than, than there's, no, there's no better discipline for applying this than direct marketing. Okay, modernization. I did say that uh, earlier that uh, the pay to play pervades the game, game itself from design through delivery. In traditional games, we are used to having a revenue model. The only really new revenue model, the, new, the only dramatically new revenue model of the 25 years previous to 2008 was when we went from the uh, downloadable game to the, to the MMO model. But uh, pay to play is a far more wrenching change. The people who need to be involved are, from the start are, as I said, the game designers. It's the marketing department has to be in. The monetization group has to be in. And probably the single most important skill, especially if you're in a smaller company to acquire, is someone who can do the alchemy of gameplay and monetization. Usually this is the, the product manager or the producer role. Uh, Zynga actually, especially around 2009, 2010, got very good at it. We all, we all have heard about how analysts are critical. Most of us work in companies that have, a, have analysts, but numbers, numbers do not tell you, are not the way that you can run, the, run things. A good example is Zynga with Farmville. They basically went through 40, I think it was roughly 40 iterations where the game, where they made changes each week, all of which were designed to create better revenues and more engagement and they all worked within the context of one week inc increments. But by the end of that process, they had a game that was full of road straps. Don't leave now, don't leave now, you know, come do this, come do that, come do something else. And they had to, br what they did was they brought in, they had an intervention where they gave a game designer, a very skilled game designer named Bruce Harlick, the ability to redesign it and make it a fun game again. The, um, the finance department is part, the finance or the monetization part has to be part of your free to, of anything that you do that's free to play or even freemium. And the other thing to understand is that when money pervades the decision, when one of the first things about, uh, one of the, when the top priority of a game may be to get people to spend rather than to get people to enjoy, which is of course something that, will dis that disturbs a lot of us who thinks that, you know, the thing is about the fun, then you will see things. And Hollywood is a good object lesson over here. We're moving towards a world in which there are, there are tentpole games, the big releases that are out there. And one of the things that's interesting is seeing how, whether or not we go with the art house model and whether we go with, whether we go with the niche model. But uh, a good thing to see is we've seen many other popular cultures depending on being able to get people play, uh, you know, spend money early at the top of the funnel. And the reason I mentioned the movies is that they are so dependent on the first week grosses. So about 30 some odd years ago, uh, when, as one of my colleagues said, the games was a zero billion dollar market, a lot of us said, we want this to be a mass market. It is. Korea was the first country to top the 85% of the population playing games. Now Western Europe and North America have tipped where more than 50% more than 50 of the population, population plays games. It is, uh, they are approaching ubiquity. In fact, um, 
you know, we will see games become an 85% of the population activity as older people like me die off. I mean, essentially it's just every, almost 90 to 95% of all children are exposed to games before they turn, they turn five. That is our future. It's going to be something that everyone does. Games entertainment has become a very steep pyramid. Uh, we've seen this happen with the traditional box games where a couple of titles like Call of Duty, Call of Duty sell record numbers, record numbers of titles and, and, do, extraordinary, and do extraordinary numbers. Um, and then everything else, every, the middle tier pretty much drops off and then there's a huge number of small games at the bottom level. Another thing that is going on is games, one consequence of games becoming a mass market is people know about, uh, people know about them instinctively. So we see them in e-commerce, we see them in business, we see them in education. The example that, uh, you know, this is put under the rubric gamification. You know, if you look at things like loyalty programs, they are all designed about leveling up and putting things in. One thing that is good for those of you who have gotten good at games is if you don't hack it in the commercial games that we do over here, there are plenty of other industries that want, your, that want you. So the good news is if you are a game designer and, you want to, and you're having problems making it work in the games business, luckily your skills are now useful outside of the, uh, out of the business that we're in. The most consequential trend that matters is understanding the demographic cohorts of game players um, most people know that most people know that the great divide between 18, you know, 17 and 18, when when people start being allowed to use credit cards, between 12 and 13, when COPPA affects things, but there's a big difference between even 30-year-olds and 20-year-olds. They grew up with a different relationship with the mobile device. This is a topic that is an hour-long talk, but you need to understand. You need to, under, right now we think of, we often think of our audience as data sets. And the problem is that, that we have to understand that they are people and how they adopt things. I regret I don't have time to explore this further, but I, I wanna say gamers are people too is probably the takeaway I'll give you from that. And then lastly, I was challenged uh, by my colleagues, including David, to, uh, uh, to leave you with something that was relatively thought provoking. So, we did want, I and my colleagues from the 1970s, 1980s, and 1990s want games to be a mass market. Be careful what we wish for. Um, what is a traditional, you hear at many conferences, people say, it's, you, you have to start with quality, you have to start with a good product. I'm not sure for the mass market that's, that's any longer true. Um, right now we are tra training an entire generation and getting the majority of our revenues from games that involve derivative repetitive play. In other words, we want things where the mechanics are absolutely recognizable. So we were suppressing the sort of originality and gameplay that we wanted before. So for those of us who play, you know, for those of us who play classic games um, from console to PC, our market share is declining. Part of that's a natural effect of the mass market coming out. But another thing is we are not training the next generation to be able to like the games that we grew up in. Um, if digital games kill so-called classic games, things like Call of, if Call of Duty becomes a niche, this will not be the first time it's happened in the games business. There was the war game business, there are the, uh, there are the adventures, all of these have gone away. By the way, when I say first person shooters could disappear, They'll, they'll still exist. They'll exist as Kickstarter projects that you raise several million dollars for in 2018 if they go away. So, but it will become the minority of the business unless this trend changes. So um, I'd like not to end this on a complete downer because um, mo especially for those of you who are hungover. So there is an example of a game business, a quality business that went away um, which was the board game, the adult board game market basically disappeared in the 1990s. And the German market, led by Settlers of Catan, which I suspect many of you know because it sold nearly 20 million copies in the original, actually has brought back fun strategic games after, you know, after the adult board game market had all but died. In any event, um, thank you for listening. If you would like a 
Um, thank you for listening. If you would like a copy of this presentation, my, my uh, email address is over there, and I will be happy to forward it to, uh, to anybody. But thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Eric.